If reports are true, Vladimir Putin thought the conflict in Ukraine would be over in a matter of days. But the fighting has now been raging for more than 10 months, and it shows no signs of ending, with Russian forces having suffered a string of setbacks. Ukrainian officials have said that Moscow is preparing a major offensive at the start of the new year. If that goes ahead and fails to make a breakthrough, what will be the effect on the Russian president? Can he hold on to power in the face of defeat? Welcome to Roundtable, I'm Philip Hampshire. Every time Russia suffers a setback in Ukraine, there's speculation that this could be the final fatal blow to Putin. Every time he appears in public, analysts attempt to find evidence that his health is failing. When Putin cancelled his annual end-of-the-year press conference, the rumours started up once again. It's the first time he hasn't done one in more than a decade. But then, he defied expectations and he showed up in Belarus for talks with his close ally, Alexander Lukashenko. So, has Putin really been weakened by the Ukraine conflict, or is it just wishful thinking from his critics? After 23 years in the Kremlin, will he still be there at the end of 2023? Joining me today, we have in Boston, Massachusetts, Anu Danieri. He's the assistant director at the Atlantic Council's Eurasia Center. Meanwhile, in London, I have Donatilla Sagramoso, who is a senior lecturer at King's College London, and in the Georgian capital of Tbilisi, Natia Saskuria, who's executive director of the Regional Institute for Security Studies, a think tank based in Tbilisi. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining me. Uh, Andrew, if I can start with you for a second. What can we expect in the coming months in Ukraine? The Ukrainians are saying there's a big Russian push coming. The Ukrainians have said that several times, while still they've been pushing Russian forces further back. What are you anticipating in the new year? Well, certainly we'll see Ukrainians trying to push the Russians back in the south and in the east. Ukrainians took Kherson earlier this fall, and I think they might try to sever the so-called land bridge between um, occupied Crimea and Russian-occupied Donbass to kind of um, split up Russian forces and make it harder for Russia to defend Crimea. Uh, you're right, we have heard Ukrainian officials say that they expect or foresee some kind of Russian assault on Kyiv, either in the winter or in the early spring. That's certainly possible, but I'm not sure exactly how Russia would plan to do that. They failed to take Kyiv with some of their best troops um, last February and in early March. And now they have maybe even greater numbers, but really, really poorly trained troops now. So it's difficult to see how they would kind of unstick themselves in the east and then go on and take a, an offensive operation like that. Well, we have a map here of uh, the current state of play. Obviously, the battle lines move back and forth. These are the battle lines as were current on, uh, uh, on Friday, the 16th of December. Uh, and the Russians have, apart from Crimea and a relatively small patch in the south and east, they've lost almost all of their land everywhere else. Domitilla, back at the start of this war, there was a brief period where the Russians were within sort of a stone's throw distance of Kyiv. They've lost all of that. Where do you see this going over the course of 2023? Is the war in Ukraine going to be over in a few months? Is this going to be one that drags on forever and ever and ever? What is your take on where things head from here? Uh, thank you. Yes, I think that uh, the war is going to drag on for quite some time. Uh, both sides are, are not ready to um, to surrender in any way, or there is no no room for any kind of compromise, because both sides have the hope that they can, uh, you know, um, defeat the enemy or acquire more territory. Uh, and the momentum is uh, still very much, I think, now on the Ukrainian side. And there is a very strong um, sort of assessment that if they um, receive additional equipment, additional weaponry, and the training that is currently taking place uh, is continued, uh, that then they, they may have a chance to acquire and, and, and liberate the territory that is occupied by Russian forces. And, uh, and the Russians, in turn, they are, you know, we know that there is a significant increase in the uh, defense spending, um, uh, almost uh, almost uh, one third of, of the budget. 
there are estimates that uh, the numbers are that uh, Russia might be spending uh, around 119 billion in defense spending in next year. Uh, so I think that the economy is really uh, very much geared towards um, uh, sort of supporting the war effort. So there's going to be a lot of emphasis on industrial military production, on training forces, on providing the necessary equipment, logistical support. So I think we can expect the Russians trying, not necessarily succeeding, as the previous speaker said, but at least trying to uh, to maybe in, in the early uh, start of the year or in the spring to carry out a, a military offensive. Uh, and to try maybe uh, to advance from the north, uh, from Belarus, and maybe attempt again to uh, either to take Kiev or to sort of uh, try to push further in the Donbass, despite uh, sort of the, the, the difficulties that they're facing there. Do, they, this, do that, they, in your opinion, do they have a hope of actually achieving that, given how poorly the Russian forces have been doing since, well, since the summer of 2022? I think that the, 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 the mindset is, is probably the following. They are thinking that they have to do it in some way. I mean, that's Putin's probably mindset is, you know, we have to succeed in, in, in you know, and do whatever it takes. So that's why they're throwing so many soldiers uh, to this sort of carnage, uh, you know, there is a kind of meat grinder. So I think that, uh, you know, they are thinking that if they really, uh, you know, use all the resources of Russia, you know, that are available and, and all the effort that they will eventually succeed and that they will uh, not only sort of break the will uh, of uh, sort of of, the, of many Ukrainians to continue with their resistance, but also that Europeans might start getting tired of providing, you know, uh, support, that the cost in Europe is going to be too high, that the pressure is going to build uh, for Ukraine to sort of, uh, you know, reach some kind of compromise. Um, so I think that that's what they're banking on. So it's, it's more than just, you know, the campaign, the military campaign on the terrain. Uh, so I think there is probably a sense that if they really carry out uh, uh, these sort of brutal attacks uh, that eventually the Ukrainians will, will be forced to either withdraw or maybe they can in some way sort of weaken significantly the Ukrainian armed forces to the point that uh, the Ukrainians are forced to, to sit at the negotiating table. I think the Russians would ideally like already now to sit at the negotiating table and reach a solution which is in their favor. But the Ukrainians, of course, are not ready to accept the current situation on the ground. Uh, and all the conditions that have been put forward by, by Russia, which we already know. And, uh, you me, know, so uh, I think that... We'll, we'll come back to that in a moment, if I may. I, I just want to bring Natia in here. Natia, um, the, the view of the situation in Ukraine from Georgia has to be a very particular one, because while the situations aren't identical, there's certainly uh, an echo or a rhyme between what's happened in Georgia in 2007, 2008, and what is going on in Ukraine right now. Absolutely. Um, in 2008, we have seen a full-scale Russian aggression against Georgia and the, uh, and the occupation of 20% of Georgian territories. Yet, what we see in Ukraine nowadays, this is a, this is a new uh, scale of the war, a whole new scale of the war that Russia is waging against Ukraine. And uh, uh, we have seen Putin's ambitions growing, uh, growing um, increasingly, uh, increasingly throughout the, the past couple of years. Uh, but uh, also what we see now that is very much different from the Georgian experience is the United West. And uh, I think that's where uh, Putin miscalculated, because I don't think he expected that level of support towards Ukraine. And uh, we, we see that uh, now the momentum is absolutely on the Ukrainian side. Hence, uh, the prospects of uh, any sort of negotiations leading to uh, the loss of Ukrainian territories is uh, unlikely because the Ukrainians are, are simply against of sitting at the negotiation table and accepting the current reality. Uh, but at the same time, I agree with colleagues, uh, and I think Kremlin is uh, trying to find new solutions now because uh, it, Putin simply cannot afford to lose this war and uh, and uh, to accept that uh, this was a huge miscalculation and uh, a humiliating defeat for the Russian uh, military forces. If I could take it across, Andrew, um, if, I, if, if I highlight some of the words that have come up in the conversation so far, we've had Putin can't afford to lose this war. Um, the Russians have been pushed back. Meat grinder was the word used by Domitilla, and I think that's a pretty accurate description of what's been going on in Ukraine. 
So if you're Vladimir Putin, what happens to you over the course of next year? There's lots of people predicting lots of different things. Could there be a coup in Russia? Could he be forced to step down? Could he have uh, health problems? Uh, could he be deposed in some way? Are you expecting Putin to end up in any one of those situations? I think it's certainly possible that we, um, you know, people have talked a good bit about the possibility of an elite coup, as it were, in, in Moscow, because there's certainly not going to be a popular uprising in Russia. The Russians are not interested in that. And all of the opposition politicians actually operate outside of Russia now. So the popular kind of protest option is off the table. However, I think more likely is the prospect that Putin will understand that you know, in order to stay in power while losing this war, it actually makes more sense for him to back down and kind of claim some small victory as a way of keeping the elites and these kind of upper middle tier uh, siloviki, as they're called, um, on his side. Because I, I do think it's unlikely um, that we'll have a, a full sort of elite coup because so many of these people um, are invested in Putin's system. But Putin is calculating. He does understand um, you know, the power within the, the system that he's built. And I think he'll be very cautious and, and know that um, he does need to keep um, a certain amount of, of power and support on his side. So he'll be careful um, if it does get down to it and Russia continues to lose. Domitilla, uh, if you're Vladimir Putin right now, how do you secure your position? Obviously, your, your grade A position, if you're Vladimir Putin, is to win the war. And if you win the war, then you're a hero of the Russian people and you're fine. But he's not winning the war. He is having to throw more and more money and resources and people at this battle in order to keep it alive. So what do you do? Well, I think that what is happening now is that in a, in a, to a certain extent, Putin has become hostage of sort of more hardline forces. Of course, his position is not being challenged directly. I think he was very successful in, in sort of handling the, the opposition that, that emerged internally. Uh, he, he managed to keep a, sort of a, a sound economic team in place who could uh, address uh, the, the immediate impact of the sanctions and of the war and, and to avoid a complete collapse of the Russian economy. Uh, mobilization uh, has, has been going on, but it hasn't really sort of completely discredited uh, the, the regime of Putin. So uh, what, what he really needs to worry is those who have been supportive of a very strong uh, operation and a very aggressive operation in Ukraine. And I think that that's what we have seen in the last months or so has been Putin moving increasingly to the right in many ways and, uh, you know, carrying out a much more brutal and a much more uh, aggressive campaign, which also involves, as we know, the destruction of Ukrainian energy infrastructure and, and many other elements of, of the state system, uh, so that it's very hard for the economy to function, so that people feel the pain. So I think that this also reflects the fact that there are vo voices, have been voices that range from uh, Ramzan Kadyrov in Chechnya to uh, Prigozhin, the head of Wagner, to other military bloggers who've been very, very critical of the war and are sort of, in a way, pushing Putin to, to really carry out this operation successfully. So I think his worries now are more with these kind of people than those who are on the sort of more liberal uh, no war uh, campaign or side. You know, I think these people have been, to a certain extent, uh, controlled and silenced, at least at the moment. I think in the longer term, these are the people who are going to be uh, the real challenge. So I think what Putin is thinking now is that he really wants to, uh, you know, he's, he's patient, he wants to, uh, uh, you know, de um, organize all the resources effectively and, and, and carry out and continue with this operation as long as he thinks it, it's necessary. Of and, course, and he, sort of normalize in many ways this situation. He has, he has fewer resources now than he might have done, sort of looking back at this just a couple of years ago, partly because of the economic sanctions, but also the decline in Russia's GDP. If uh, we pull up some of the numbers on this, Russia's uh, economy is expected to continue to shrink in 2023. The expectations come Coming through from the IMF, the World Bank, and the OECD, all pointing to a decline. Um, around about 3.4% is the best case scenario. 
4.5% is the worst case scenario. So, Natia, if you're looking at the end of December 2023, is Vladimir Putin still in power in Moscow or has there been a leadership change one way or another? Well, obviously, we have been hearing a lot of theories about how uh, this war could end up for Putin. And uh, so far, we have seen that the opposition has been completely destroyed by uh, Putin through various levels of repression. Uh, but also, when it comes to the hardliners, the Silaviki, I don't think that there is a, uh, there, there is a sense at this point that uh, a change needs to come. So I think uh, for the foreseeable future, uh, from the Western perspective, at least the West must be ready to deal with uh, Putin uh, rather than any sort of uh, different leadership within Moscow. But of course, a lot will depend how uh, successful the Ukrainian forces will be on the battlefield. And uh, we have seen that um, successful uh, counteroffensives from the Ukrainian side has led Putin to uh, resort to some of the means such as mobilization that was almost out of the table at the beginning. We were uh, seeing uh, and looking for, um, uh, we were seeing uh, some uh, prospects uh, from the from Moscow side that were uh, overly optimistic, and uh, this was not expected by any means. Uh, so uh, much will depend on the situation, uh, on what kind of situation we will have on the ground in Ukraine. Andrew, if you were a betting man, would you expect Putin to still be in power in uh, December 2023? I would. Why? How, how is it that he can be in the position that he currently is in, with the Russian economy in decline, with, well, at this point, tens of thousands of young Russian men dying in a very difficult situation in Ukraine? He hasn't made massive material gains there. What is it that he's holding, is keeping him in office? Well, I think... The strongest card Putin can play is to try to drag out the war as long as possible. Um, he frankly doesn't care how many Russians have to die um, in his war, and he doesn't care how bad the economy gets. He doesn't care about the Russian people. He cares about his kleptocratic system and his imperial ambitions uh, in Ukraine. So if you're Putin um, and, and your power rests on these um, elite power in Moscow rather than on the will of the people, you're focused more clearly on positioning yourself as the person who can win and extend the war. And as a previous panelist said, wait out Europe um, if possible. So the kind of economic concerns and the you know, Russians dying in Ukraine, I don't think really factors into his calculus at this point. Domitilla, same question to you. Are you expecting Putin to still be there a year from now? I think so. I think that uh, there is a very high chance that he stays. I think he, uh, and, and what worries me is that uh, this sort of situation of war becomes sort of normalized, uh, that people uh, sort of internalize the fact in Russia that they have to make sacrifices and they show a readiness to do that. Uh, and, uh, and because they are not being, uh, except for the areas near the border, there is no massive bombing of, of Russian areas. They don't feel this, this um, war so closely. Uh, as, as others. Of course, there are families who, who suffer from the loss of their loved ones, but uh, as, as a whole population, uh, the numbers still are not very high. So I think that there is a very high chance that this will continue. Uh, if we look also at the numbers and the expenditure, for example, on uh, the security forces that Putin is, is ready to, uh, to support, we're talking about, uh, about figures around $46 billion to be spent also uh, in support of the security forces. So that means very clearly that he's going to, uh, you know, nurture the security apparatus to make sure that, um, that uh, you know, there is no uh, effective opposition uh, that can challenge him, you know, from the grassroots level. Uh, and I think the elites are, are constantly being, you know, forced to toe the line uh, and, 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 uh, and to help in this war effort. Uh, and, and as I said, I think that, that uh, you know, the, the, the management of the economy, although it's, it's of course not ideal, but they found ways to sort of circumvent sanctions. Uh, there are lots of reports of countries that have, uh, you know, become sort of hubs where a lot of the uh, sort of sanction material sort of um, passes through. So they're finding all these ways around it. It's not going to be a glorious time for Russia, but I don't see... Uh, you know, a complete collapse yet, unfortunately. So a lot you... will depend on what happens in Ukraine itself. Domitilla, the West loves a villain. 
whether it's Saddam Hussein in Iraq or Colonel Gaddafi in Libya, those are two names who immediately su summed up their <coughs> countries in a particular period of time, as far as many people in the West are concerned. And of course, Russia right now, they're summing it up with the same, uh, with the name of Vladimir Putin. Does the West really want Vladimir Putin to leave though? Those examples of Libya, of Libya and Iraq, the moment the dictator was removed from power, the countries collapsed into anarchy. Does the West really want Putin gone? Well, I think on the one hand, definitely, because this war is very costly for Europe and uh, also for the West in general, uh, the United States as well. I mean, there's, there's a lot of expenditure. There is an you know, there's been, you know, as we know, issues around the energy uh, market and, and increases in energy prices, which have uh, had a very negative impact on, on the economies and on inflation. So, uh, you know, everyone would want, uh, you know, Vladimir Putin to go and ideally to be replaced by someone who accepts uh, defeat and withdraws Russian forces. This is the ideal scenario. Uh, of course, there is concern that, uh, you know, if Russia loses this war, which I think that uh, is, a, is a possibility and is one of the factors that could lead to Putin's downfall is if, you know, on the ground, on the terrain, Ukraine uh, succeeds in dislodging Russian forces, then the position of Putin becomes a lot more shaky. Uh, and in that case, you know, we can expect uh, some kind of, you know, uh, internal turmoil. And that is also not an ideal solution. But I think there is very little that the West can do and the, the West can influence in that respect uh, events inside, inside Russia. And I think Russians themselves are not very keen to go through another kind of internal uh, revolution because from the, those with whom I am in touch, you know, the, the experiences of, of previous, uh, you know, revolutionary change in Russia has not been very positive. So I think Russians themselves are not very keen to go through a similar process uh, again. What they would like is a transition where Putin leaves power and there is a, a more sensible and a more uh, sort of moderate, maybe, um, you know, I'm not saying pro-Western, but at least not so anti-Western regime as the current one. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, that's what we should all hope. I think it's, uh, you know, arguing that there could be a bit of turmoil inside Russia uh, is not a good argument in my view. Of course, we have to worry if, if Russia descends into chaos. Uh, and that's not, nothing, not a scenario that, that anyone, you know, uh, would really d desire. Uh, we, I think that the, the objective is to have a Russia that is, uh, that is not so uh, aggressive externally, that is, uh, you know, those armed forces are not capable to launch a similar operation in five, ten years' time. That should be our main objective. Andrew, um, do you think the West really wants to see Putin gone, or is the risk here simply that bye-bye uh, Putin, in Putin Mark II, in comes a second person who is equally aggressive, equally in favour of an expanded greater Russia? Well, the West, and I think most of the world, honestly, would like to see Putin gone. Um, China, for example, is, uh, I think, I think Beijing is furious about this war as well, that um, Russia and, and Putin has disrupted global um, markets in the way that he does and kind of prolonged this uh, economic slowdown over the past few years. And, and it's true that the war is contributing to um, a kind of global economic slowdown and, and increasing costs all over the world. Um, I do think it, in that sense, it is in global and Western interests for Putin to leave power. And quite frankly, um, a Russia that is, you know, a bit more uncertain, maybe with slightly less control from Moscow, is less of a threat to the West, um, both from an aggressive uh, military standpoint and from a hybrid warfare standpoint. So um, I do think that that would be a positive outcome, not only for the West, but also for Russia, Ukraine, and much of the, the developing world. Natia, very quickly from you, uh, do you think that the West really wants to see Putin gone, or is there a risk you could end up with someone worse in his place? Yes, I think the West definitely uh, prefers Putin to be gone because this uh, war is uh, very costly for the West uh, and uh, Putin not only faces, you, fa faces Ukraine nowadays, it's the war against the whole Western uh, world. 
as we have seen uh, in the in the previous years, the West has Western countries have been also faced by various means of hybrid warfare uh, waged by Moscow. So I think uh, West would be definitely better off uh, dealing with somebody who is less aggressive than Putin is. But al also another question is what sort of Russia the West will be facing after Putin. So that is the question we cannot answer at the moment. But definitely more chaotic Russia. Uh, and less a able or Russia to wage this uh, kind of military um, military um, uh, adventures against uh, the, the 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 neighboring countries would be a better outcome for the West. Natia uh, Andrew Domitilla, thank you very much for joining me today, agreeing to talk about this topic. Remember, you can see more discussion and debate on our YouTube channel. Just head over to YouTube and search for Roundtable TRT World. But for now, from me here and the entire team, goodbye. And thank you for watching.